What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Random Red Shirt Podcast. I am one of the hosts, Zach, and hosting with me, as always, is Chris. What's going on, buddy? Hello, Zach. Zach, great to be here again, and we have such a wonderful guest with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's just awesome. Um, don't we, Zach? We have Elizabeth. We sure do. Yes, we are honored and thrilled to welcome Elizabeth Dennehy to the podcast. Elizabeth is a classically trained actress who has played in a ton of television shows and movies to include Total Recall, Quantum Leap, Seinfeld, Clear and Present Danger, Gattaca, Soldier, NYPD Blue, Chicago Hope, Charmed, Boston Legal, The Mentalist, and of course, she's our favorite hothead commander, Shelby, in Star Trek The Next Generation, and now promoted Admiral Shelby in Star Trek Picard Season 3. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us here on the Random Redshirt Podcast. My pleasure. Um, I was never in Total Recall. I don't oh, you weren't? That. Don't know why that's on IMDb. Oh, okay. Well, the first time I was asked about it, I was like, "Was I?" Was I? <laughs> I'm so confused, and I, I, I do not understand. I don't even know the actress that they think is me. I, it's baffling. It's so weird. All right. Well, curses to you, IMDb. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Schwarzenegger in an elevator once but that's that's it that's that's it all that right well he awesome. he wasn't mind wiped at that time I guess so all right <laughs> well we like to start from the very beginning Elizabeth anytime we have guests on we always like to go back in the way machine uh they time travel in Star Trek let's do that too and let's start from the very beginning what's your earliest memory of of acting or wanting to get into acting when when did that start for you I can't remember not being into it. My father, as you know, is an actor. He and his brother were obsessed with movies. And so back in the day, back in the olden times, boys and girls, where there were like only four, four TV channels. <laughs> and if a movie you liked came on, you would read the TV guide and the whole family would sit around the TV and they were obsessed with On the Waterfront and they would at reenact scenes from that uh, Marlon Brando and they made would make home movies back in like the 60s where it was like really hard to do <laughs> you had to borrow somebody's camera so I was steeped in this um, kind of obsession with acting and actors and uh, I, I, it's really incredible when I think about it. my father was 21 when I was born on the uh, Camp Lejeune Marine base. And he had three kids by the time he was 26 and doing odd jobs just to keep food on the table. He must have had this compulsion to act because somebody with all of that pressure on them, you know, to support a family so young, the fact that he would carve out time to create community theater and dinner theater on Long Island where I grew up. So our weekends were spent being dragged in and out of like rehearsal. The Amityville Community Theater was at the Amityville High School where I grew up. And we grew up backstage while dad was doing rehearsals and we were jobbed in. We were the no neck monsters in Catamahunton Roof. We were the snow children in Carousel. We were, you know, we were jobbed in to be kids whenever they needed kids. So that was normal for me. And it wasn't until I got older that I learned that that was pretty unusual. You know, it was almost like we were like a circus family or a vaudeville family. <laughs> he, he, my, my father had this compulsion to be an actor and he would direct shows. He would be in shows. I remember he played Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof. He did dinner theater, the Sayville in the Watermelon Playhouse in, in Sayville, Long Island. And so I, I, I just, I'm, I think about it all the time, like how he made that happen despite all of the things working against him, you know, you know, make an honest living. His parents were like, we'll help you out as long as you promise to stop doing theater. It was like he was <laughs> mainlining and he was doing theater on the side, hmm. sneaking out of the house on a, a, a behind his parents' back to go do regional theater down at uh, Bucks County Playhouse and Lampertville, New Jersey. And it was intriguing and it was enthralling. I can, one of my very first memories was him doing The Tempest in a community theater, Amityville. And we were the fairies in The Tempest. And he was Stefano and he was the director. 
And then he was doing Man of La Mancha in Lambertville, you know, the music circus, whatever they called it, in a big tent. And we would drive into the city and pick up these flamenco dancers <laughs> who were Sancho Panza's horses. And they were gorgeous and sexy and exotic. And it was just intriguing. And so it, I got the message at an early age that this was way more fun than working in an office or a cubicle. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And you got to, you got to see his passion for the art. I mean, that intense like passion. What a unique. Yeah, it is very unique because he had this dream and it was a crazy dream. He had no reason to think he would be a success, but he that's why I say it was like a compulsion. Mm -hmm. He had to do this. And I even though like my father was not around a lot growing up, you know, he was always mm -hmm. working. Uh, that role model of somebody actually pursuing the dream relentlessly, the dedication that that is required and the determination. My friends, fathers would be very wistful. And when I would be like, go to a sleepover, how did your dad do it? Where did he get the bravery from? And for mm -hmm. me, it was just so normal. It wasn't until I was later that I went, God, where did he get that bravery and ambition and fearlessness from? Hmm. Wow, that, that's awesome! Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's that's awesome. Like in in terms of your your own, like when you were growing up and your own personal interests in the different like genres of film and, and television. Like, did you have any interest in um, was science fiction one of the interests that you had in in, <laughs> in, in genres, or um, were there other interests as well? So here's the thing. Yeah. Um. I have a confession. I never watched the original Star Trek. I never watched Next Gen before I got on. I and I go to conventions and I confess this as if they're going to tar and feather me uh, <laughs> because I feel like such an imposter. And people will say to me, what did you watch? What do you watch? And when I was a kid, I was the kid obsessed with The Six Wives of Henry VIII upstairs downstairs mm. For some reason i i was really into period costumes and period especially british things so merchant ivory that was my jam i um i went to an all-girl catholic high school and guess what the girls who were into sci-fi were <laughs> not cool they were <laughs> cool chicks they were they were smart they ran things. They were the presidents and they were the mathematicians and the scientists, but they weren't the cool chicks. And uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't alluring. Mm. I uh. thought, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm curious, how do you get bit by the bug of sci-fi as a young child? I think for me, uh, I, I mean, I was one of those kids who never grew out of wanting to be an astronaut. And so all the way through high school, I did. And the reason I got bit by the sci-fi bug was my mom used to have reruns of Star Trek, the original series and next gen, at least the early seasons on when I was a kid. Uh, and that's kind of where it started. I, I just have always been drawn to science fiction technology. I mean, I watch other stuff too, but the idea of the stars and the universe and yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but I wanted to be Nancy and Oliver. <laughs> So that's where, what I wanted to be was, you know, um, speak with a Cockney accent. And we, I, <laughs> just, I, I went on and also Shakespeare has been always a huge, huge theme in our lives. Like I said, my dad did The Tempest. When I was in the fourth grade, we were cast in a dumbed down version of Much, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And I was cast as Helena and I danced the whole way home for, on the uh, from the bus stop because the boy I had a huge crush on was Demetrius. So, and that's fourth grade. So like when I say I can't remember a time where that wasn't a driving force and a dream, I, re I mean it. I mean, I, I, I remember my father was directing a production of Funny Girl and I was obsessed. My sisters and I would play the musical theater albums constantly and act mm. all the musicals mary poppins and, and man of la mancha and guys and dolls and funny girl and fiddler we we were just playing those records all the time and i made my father 
uh, auditioned me for Fanny Bryce. I was 13, you know, I just, yeah, we were just, we were stage brats. We were really obsessed with that. Hmm. So yeah. That so, all right. I, I do have a question for you. This is a little bit of a personal question here for me. Um, I have a nine-year-old daughter who is become obsessed and wants to be an actress so badly. She just did her first theater camp and she got bit by the bug, as you would say. So my question is, what what advice would you give to somebody her age, younger, older, somebody who's aspiring to be an actor or an actress who wants to get into this and maybe pursue this as a profession? Well, you said that she did a theater camp? She did, yes. Okay, so what you need to do is, uh, what grade is she in? She's in fourth grade. So does does the school do shows? Her her elementary school does not, uh, but there is opportunities in the area at, um, when they have auditions and stuff for kids. Yeah. I would I would sign her up, sign her up. It could take its course, and, and she gets burnt out. And when I mean I've I've no idea. What usually happens is they get to a certain age where there are kids who are like amazing, and so if she's one of those kids, fabulous. But if she's not, she might go, oh, oh, so that's what's, re I, I remember when I was in um, school and I thought I was a good singer and I heard somebody who was like, like shockingly good. And you went, okay, now I'm starting to get an idea of the pecking order, but until mm -hmm. then just have fun, just let her have fun doing it. Yeah. Really, really fun. Don't worry about, uh, you know, my my son is 25 he's about to turn 26 and he is an actor he was in the weird al yankovic biopic and he um not supposed to tell anybody this but he just did three episodes of the bear um and so nice. he's working he really is working that's awesome and he didn't do any theater or acting or anything when he was a kid he went to an arts high school and was at the the first acting he did was high school ninth grade so let her just have fun it is so much fun it's so much fun, especially those years before you realize, oh, I may not be that great. And if she is, fantastic. But the years where she's not comparing herself against anybody else and it's the camaraderie and the togetherness, it can be their team sport. Yeah. So my kids did School of Rock. So they, the, when they were like eight, nine, and 10, they kept, they really wanted to be in rock bands. They were not athletes. We tried T-ball. We tried soccer. It was hopeless. <laughs> but School of Rock has franchises all over the country. And we found one. And that was our team sport. And so they learned yeah. how to play. Um, they you Every week, you would have an instrument lesson for like 45 minutes. And then you would have band rehearsal. And they would do the, Jack, Jack's first show was a Beatles show at the Whiskey A Go-Go nice so and then every three months they would put on a show and there were kids who were like determined to make a career in music my kids weren't they just it was fun it was really really fun for them yeah so keep those keep i would keep as long as possible the fun the camaraderie the joy of performing before it gets to be competitive and you know a downer yeah yeah, I think I think it's important, right? Is to have fun. That's really what it boils down to. It's not fun. There's no point. Exactly. Yeah, and then like you said, you get the burnout, and then it's not something you want to do. I I I I did theater in high school, and that was my freshman year of high school. It was the first time I'd ever got up on stage and done anything. And I was in the Wizard of Oz, and I had a so a one line solo, and I was scared out of my mind. But as soon as the first opening night was over, I was hooked, and I did seven more plays after that. And I never, I mean, I didn't continuing to act in unfortunately but it was a blast and so i'm just hoping that if this is what she wants to do that she just has fun doing it yeah and if she gets to the stage where she's really good and really determined then you cross that bridge when it comes to it but keep the fun doors open as long as possible yeah for sure that's great advice yeah that is that is interesting so elizabeth so you're still you're still really actively involved in theater right now right um well, the pandemic was a lot to recover from. Mm. I was uh, right before the world shut down. I did a play um, at San Diego Rep. Uh, I stayed down in San Diego called The Humans, written by Stephen Karam. And that was really wonderful. I had so much fun. 
Um, I, d I do uh, bits and pieces, not, not as much as I would like. I would like to do a lot more. You know, Hollywood is hard for women over 40. Forget about when you get like way past 40. So it's, it's hard. But um, yeah, I would like to do more. I also, um, so my kids went to this arts high school called the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts. Josh Groban is probably our most famous. Phoebe Bridgers, those are our two most famous alum. Heim, the band Heim. And um, my kids went there, one Jack for theater and William for filmmaking. And I just finished about a year ago, I stopped. I was teaching there for six years, Shakespeare, because that's a real passion of mine. Um, and I'm on the board of an, the independent Shakespeare company, which does free Shakespeare in Griffith Park. We have our huge gala this Saturday, um, and I'm the chair of the gala. So I'm involved with theater. I go to the theater probably three or four times a week. I mm. wish I was on stage more, so I need to make that happen. But I, um, I'm also in, um, this, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Kevin Costner's doing this four movie Western saga called Horizon. I so heard about that. Yeah. I go back to Moab, Utah for movie two. I'm in movie one, two, and four. Nice. Oh. I did movie one in September. Oh my gosh. Just Sienna Miller is the star. And she and I were looking at each other like, I am pinching myself. You cannot, I don't know if you've ever been to Moab. It is mm -mm. so astonishingly beautiful, wow. just incredible. I'd never, I've never been to the Grand Canyon. I've never seen anything like this place. Just so gorgeous, and he, and Kevin is a dream. I was gonna say, I Kevin Costner is one of my top favorite actors of all time, and so I can imagine I would be, I would be probably waking myself up from passing out if <laughs> working with Kevin Costner. That would be unreal. It was unreal. My first day on the set, me, hi, nice to meet you. I'm wearing a corset, a hoop skirt, and I had this big emotional scene. Michael Rooker's playing my husband. I mean, mm. we just kept saying to each other, to me, you know, I'm pinching myself. I can't believe I'm not dreaming. I can't believe I was a high school theater teacher and now I'm here doing this. Well, that's I wonderful. I'll watch anything Kevin Costner's in. So, and if you're going to be in it, then that's just icing on the cake. I can't wait to see those movies come out then. He wrote it and is in it and is directing. That's um, wonderful. Amazing. Yeah. That'll be great to, we'll have to keep an eye out for that and, and watch for your scenes for sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, so things are going well. Things are really going well. Life is pretty magical right now. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, okay. So we, th there was a, a, a sitcom that you appeared on in the 90s, a couple of years after Star Trek, that was actually, I believe, by TV Guide, voted the greatest sitcom of all time, and that was Seinfeld. <laughs> so I'm curious as to uh, how that came about. Uh, I mean, obviously, I know there's auditioning and stuff like that, but but kind of how that came about, because because uh, from, from my rem memory, you were in an episode called The Handicap Spot playing a character called Allison. And uh, I mean, that show, you just watch it and you laugh every single episode. So how, how did that come about? How'd that role come about? Well, I went to an audition like uh, uh, any other. And it was the Drake yet. So it's the Drake's fiance. And I find it kind of intimidating. Needing to be funny in front of really funny people is mm. scary to me. But the great thing about this part, I think I had auditioned for that show um, more than once, if I remember correctly. And the great thing about that part is the more serious she is, the funnier it is. <laughs> that you don't have to be really funny and like do a setup and a punchline and whack a boom. Uh, it was, she's humorless, absolutely humorless and hates Drake and hates his friends. And so the more serious and sober and somber I was, the funnier the situation is. So it didn't feel that pressure that I had to be really funny and knock it out of the ballpark. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so Rick Overton, who's a well-known stand-up comedian, was the Drake. And another a thing I remember about that episode was that show, I don't know if you know this, that show had been on for like three or four years before it took off. Right. 
That doesn't oh, happen. Yeah. That doesn't happen now. You get like shows get yanked after like one or two episodes if they don't do well. You you don't get a chance to just like float a show for a couple of more than a season. Yeah. It had been on for a while before it caught on. And my episode was shot the week it was shot. They had just finally broken into the top 10. So finally people were starting to take notice and pay attention to them. And they were, so they were really ecstatic and really happy and jubilant. So that was nice. I've been on sets where the show has already been canceled Mm. Like Brooklyn Bridge, I was on the show Brooklyn Bridge. It had already been canceled, but they had to finish the season. And everybody's was like, "What? So where do you want to stand? I don't care. Stand wherever you want to." You know? <laughs> but Seinfeld, they were so excited and they were so so happy. So that yeah. was, nice. and also my parents, uh, my mother and her husband were in town when it was being filmed, so they were able to be in the audience. That was cool. Oh, and, that's excellent. Yeah, that's that special. Was, yeah, very special. Yeah. How, how did the role of um, of Commander Shelby come about in, in Star Trek? Did... Lieutenant Commander? Yeah, Lieutenant Commander. Yeah. It's an audition. I went audition? in. Audition, yeah. I was 28 when I shot that. Um, yeah, did they, that's how, I mean, I suppose more and more now people are just doing straight offers. Mm-hmm. But back then, I prob- they probably had offers out, but they did. It was an uh, audition. And I went in and I think I had a call back. Um, I th- think part of the reason why I may have been successful in nabbing that part was because I didn't know anything about the world. So like when we showed up on the set and I met Jonathan and I was like, oh, you're Riker. Oh, I thought I didn't know who was the baldy guy. That's <laughs> But this is before the internet where you couldn't, now if you're auditioning for a show that you haven't watched, I'll pull up scenes on YouTube. But back then, you know, if you have enough time, you could watch the show on the day that it aired. Mm. Back then it was like, I have no idea, which kind of suits Shelby. I don't care who you are. I have a job to do. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so um, very happy that I booked it. And as it turns out, Jonathan had done theater with my dad. So when I showed up on set, he knew my father and my father's brother. So we bonded instantly over that. It was very nice. 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 So you do, you do start at the next generation. How much, because because we've talked about this in our podcast before, even very recently, Chris, um, the, the significance of best of both worlds, part one and two that you were in as Lieutenant Commander Shelby and the significance and the impact that that two-part episode has had on the franchise going forward with the effects affecting other characters and the way shows are written, stories are written, and things like that. What what kind of impact did you see in your career from that episode and that that, that shooting that, that scene, or that scene, that show, moving forward? Um, so a couple of things. The, when we shot the, I think it's the last episode of season three yes episode of season four we did not know we didn't see the second script mm. we had no idea what was going to happen so the all that waiting that you guys did over the summer we were too we had no idea interesting so that that there's that and so jonathan and i were like we don't know if we're going to end up getting married we don't know if we're going <laughs> to Hating each other's guts. (laughs) We have no clue what's going to happen. Maybe I was a Borg in disguise. We had no idea. So when people at the time, and I started doing conventions, people would say, oh, I hated you. We were planting seeds, little seeds of, you know, those little side eyes that I would give and the, like the super ambition. And can we trust her or... I don't know. Do I like her? That was all intentional because what if in the second part, I was an absolute villain and Mm. I was really more ambitious about taking Riker's place than I was about solving the Borg problem. We had to play every eventuality in shooting the first episode. So that was the first 
point that that I think people really, really need to know to understand what it was like back then. Um, the second thing is, is that Jonathan said to me, you don't have a clue what's going to happen to you. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, conventions. I said, get out of here. He said, you, he, I mean, but I think the fact that I was clueless helped me because people say to me all the time, things like, what was it like walking under the bridge? And I was like, it was a set. It was, you know, it was just a set. And I think that that was important to have Shelby's mentality of like, I'm on a ship, just like any other ship. Um, who's the top? Okay, there you are. Let's get this job done. I've got to figure out this board problem. Yeah, and here you are 33 years later still talking about that role. I mean, that's it's 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 amazing, especially since you said you went into it. It was a set, you know, it wasn't, you weren't a, a big, huge Star Trek fan going into it. You hadn't even seen it. So. Thank God, because I think I would have been so intimidated. Hmm. You know, when I watched Will Wheaton um, uh, walking onto the the reconstituted set and the awe that he had, that would have been really hard if I was playing Shelby to, if I was awestruck, hmm. if I did have a clue why, why this was so precious to so many people. I had no clue. And so my given circumstances of me, the actress matched Shelby's of like, I don't care. I don't care who you are. I don't care whose rank. I don't, I'm not, I don't care about the diplomacy. I don't care about playing nice. I don't care who likes me. I have a job to do. And uh, I mean, Elizabeth does want people to like her, <laughs> <laughs> but I had a job to do. And that is where our given circumstances matched up. It was a job. I had a job to do. And I think that that was actually really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that came across really well, actually. I and I think I think really really impactful. I did watch those episodes kind of recently, and and you did a wonderful wonderful a job job with Jonathan Frakes. So it was just he was such a doll. He's yeah. a doll, and it was so nice to do the ready room um, after we shot Picard and see them again. Again, lovely reunion. Wow. Yeah, I watched that interview. It was fantastic. That ready room interview it was great. To, it was great to see you obviously back in the role of Shelby and Star Trek Picard and, and then be able to see you talking about it and back into the franchise again. It was just fantastic. Yay. Well, yeah. Well, with with Picard, how did was that a surprise for you? How did coming back to Picard work? This is a crazy story. So 30 years have gone by. I've gone to conventions. People say, why didn't they bring you back? I have no idea. No. So, um, and we, I loved meeting her. And see, here's where, this is, this is what I'm talking about. I was fangirling all over her, not because she's the Borg Queen. I've never seen the movie she was in, but she was Roxanne with Derek Jacobi in Cyrano de Bergerac when I was a student at, at Lambda, so, Lambda. So I was fangirling over her for that. And that she had worked with my dad. So we we had a really lovely time. And I tweeted a picture of Shelby and the Borg Queen. And I don't even understand Twitter. Like I'm a little bit af afraid of it. But it for me, it got like 2000 likes and retweets and stuff. I come back from London and literally the day I come back, my agent calls and said, Picard is uh, checking your availability. And I asked Jonathan, I said, could... Could that have been because of that picture? He had no idea, but it was such a weird coincidence after yeah. so, so long, after 30 years. Mm -hmm. So they checked my availability. And apparently Jonathan said that Terry Madelis just knew that when Picard was wrapping up, he had certain actors that he wanted to come back. Roe being one yep. and uh, a few other, a list of people that he wanted to come back. And I was on that list. So Funnily, little sidebar, Michelle Forbes and I were on The Guiding Light together back in the 80s. We were dressing roommates. So she and I go way, way, way back, me and Michelle. That's awesome. Well, <clears throat> I mean, Terry, Terry's, it's evident by Picard season three that Terry has good taste. And so we are so thankful and happy that he brought you back to bring back Shelby because, uh, you know, the idea maybe back in the day when you first shot it, well, are people going to like her? Are they going to hate her character? I think at the end of the day, uh, Commander Shelby is a fan favorite. And if she wasn't 
she wouldn't have been in Picard. And if she wasn't, people wouldn't still be talking about her. I mean, your, your character, your role on next gen still resonates today. It still has a huge impact. Um, and, and in an episode, two part episode that was so massive and so impactful that I, I think it's great that they brought you back and they promoted you by the way to Admiral. So that has to be pretty cool too. And you got to, you got to command the enterprise F. So that had to been pretty sweet as well. That was really, that was really, really sweet. I, um, it's so weird too, because like I said, that convention was November, 2021. So I filmed Picard February, a year ago, February. And cause they did season two and three at the same time, which is very smart. Um, and so oh my God, this isn't going to air forever. And I just kind of had to forget about it because I didn't even tell my family. I didn't tell my sisters, you know, cause you, you get the NDA and I was afraid of it slipping out. So I really didn't tell it. My, I mean, of course my children knew and my husband knew, but I swore everybody to secrecy. Um, cause that's part of the fun, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's that's, a... yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. I mean, so the set that you shot on for your Admiral Shelby, scene did, where what did they use did they did they use the titan bridge and it was a close up shot and you sat in that chair or where where did they film that at i don't know what the ship's name is but i was on the bridge of was it the titan i have no idea yeah i'm assuming if it was the same bridge that everybody else was using it would have been the titan then yeah um it was like so so much more impressive of then 90s like lights and just um I walked in, I wish to God I had a video of me walking on because, you know, it was, we're, we're all masked and I go up a flight of steps and all of a sudden I'm in this huge ship with huge windows and everything going on. Like It was like, whoa, this is serious. It was really overwhelming. And then when I'm sitting in the chair doing the speech, Terry came up to me and said, um, there's going to be a cherry picker, a camera on a, an arm from far away, like a football field size distance away from me. I could see it. And then it, it he said, it's gonna come through that window and it's gonna come right past your face. Just want you to be warned. And I'm so glad he warned me because I'm looking right into the camera like I am now. And this huge, like cherry picker comes, you know, it's really hard to concentrate and just tune that out and it went swooping right by my face it was it was wild it was really cool so the technology like 30 years on from back in the day when you know uh, the ship would be hit and we would be like you know shaking <laughs> <laughs> and the, the set was cardboard this is like this was hardcore this was serious yeah Wow, that's excellent. The conventions in the future, if you go to conventions, is going to be complete. People are going to be wild now. They're going to, well, they'll be so happy. They'll be so happy to have you there if you're, if you're able you to get yeah, conventions. conventions. I love the conventions. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. And the cruise. I want to go on a Star Trek <clears throat> cruise. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Why not? So uh, lo looking at all the roles that you played, uh, whether it's in theater, television, movies, is there a role you've always wanted to play but haven't gotten to yet? Hmm. The first thing that leaps into my mind is um, Richard the Third. There's a part Queen Margaret that I love, and or yeah, I mean, the problem is is that she's great in the Henry Henry Sixes. Uh, one part one two and three but I'm too old for that part now but she I could do the, I could I could do her but the, I immediately go to Shakespeare but um uh god I'll tell you who I am so jealous of do you guys watch Succession I haven't yet no it's the greatest show <laughs> Jay Smith Cameron. Oh my God. She's an old friend. And I'm so jealous of her part on succession. How can you not watch the show? It's so brilliant. what What um, platform is it on or, or HBO yeah. HBO. Okay. Ryan Cox. Oh my I need God. To step. Here in Culkin. 
Jeremy Strong. There, it's an acting and writing extravaganza. So great. Mm. Add it, that to my laundry list of things I need to watch. Yeah. My household is obsessed with Succession. Mm. Yeah. Since you since you talked about Shakespeare and you love Shakespeare, and that's I feel that that's been a huge part of your life. Do you have? I'm curious if you could, if you don't mind sharing with us. Do you have a favorite of the plays now, or or has your favorites have they changed over the years, and and, that's and why? Yeah. That's a really great question. Um, it did change. I did have a favorite for all of my life. When I was a freshman at um, Hofstra University on Long Island, a theater major, I was assistant stage manager for a production of The Winter's Tale. We had a globe replica on our stage and every year they would have a big Shakespeare festival. And this was a really wonderful production. The director did a beautiful job and it was cast perfectly. And for all of my life, that was my favorite, The Winter's Tale. And then um, recently, I started becoming really into King Lear. I love King Lear. And I, I think I started liking King Lear even before my father died. My father dying before he got a chance to do King Lear is just a, a tragedy. It's such a, he, he wouldn't have had to act. I mean, it just would have been so, so perfect, such a perfect part for him. And the problem with it, that, that King Lear is like 83 when the play takes place. And the problem is men think, oh, I'm not old enough. I'm not old, old enough. But you really need to start doing it, thinking about doing it when you're about 60, when you have the strength and the stamina. And he just, he missed the boat. He missed the window. So I love, I love King Lear. Hmm. So out of, you know, you've done a, all these TV shows, all these movies, besides Star Trek, what is maybe your favorite project you've worked on or been a part of? Or do well, you have a favorite? For a long time, I would I would say the Lazarus Man. I did a another western on the TNT network with uh, Robert Urich, partly because it was in Santa Fe, which is really beautiful westerns. The costumes, the wigs. Uh, I wrote a buckboard. I I punched a, a army officer. But now that I have Horizon. Um, I I would say that that has supplanted that because for all the same reasons great hair, great costumes in a beautiful, beautiful setting. Um, I'm going to be so sad when that ends. And lucky, lucky for me, I'm in three of the four movies. So I get to go back. I go back in June for movie two and I'll get to go back again. So lucky. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm, I, that that was a gift. That's truly a blessing to be at the age I am and, you know, still be getting uh, a fantastic part like that. So much fun. And I play Irish. I play Irish. I play Mrs. Reardon. Me and Michael Verker, we only speak to each other in Irish accents on the set. Yeah, Michael Rooker is definitely a character. He's played some pretty, pretty fantastic roles. I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy, The Walking Dead. Uh, he's been in quite a bit of stuff little bit of trivia, my husband, who was an Irish actor, James Lancaster, his very first movie was with Michael Rooker, uh, something just mm. terrible called Retreads. Don't even try to watch it. It's unwatchable. <laughs> I think it's a motorcycle heist movie. Somebody's dressed up pretending to be a priest. I tried to watch it once and it was incomprehensible. I will not add that to the list of my things I need to watch. <laughs> Exonerated from that, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, my husband James actually found photographs of him and Michael Worker said about that. So crazy. We all know each other. There's literally like 10 people in the business. We all know each other. I mean, look at Kevin Costner did Silverado with my father. So that whole like six degrees, like I feel like I've gotten to the point where there's like one degree of separation between me and anybody, pretty much anywhere, anybody else. You know, the whole my whole connection with um Colomini, Colomini, who played O'Brien. So James, my husband's from Ireland. He and Colum were our best friends. They go way, way back. They've known each other since they were teenagers. So I'm living in LA and I'm doing a play at South Coast Rep with an actor called Simon Templeman, 
And Barbara Dowling, this Irish actress, and Simon Templeman hangs up the phone and says to Barbara, my wife, Rosalind Chow, just got cast as your husband's wife on Deep Space Nine. Wow. That's how that's how crazy this whole thing is. Yeah. Well, Chris, uh, be still my heart. Because, did you, because yeah, did you know that, Zach? That, no, I mean, no, no, I didn't know that. I'm 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 fanboying out heavily right now <laughs> because DS9 is my favorite of the Star Trek series, and uh, Chief O'Brien is my favorite character of the entire franchise. Wow. I'm a massive O'Brien fan. And on top of that. I also absolutely diehard love the sh- the series that Cole Meany was also in with Anson Mount, Hell on Wheels, where he played Thomas Durant, the owner of the uh, Union Pacific Railroad, and that was fantastic too. He was so good in that char- as that character. He's an amazing actor. Did you see the um the Roddy the Roddy um <laughs> the, the trilogy commitments and the van. And the snapper, all of those movies. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Oh my God, put that to the top of your list. Okay, all right. <clears throat> the commitments. The commitments is a fantastic uh, movie, and then there's a sequel, um, the van and the snapper. Amazing. He's an amazing actor. Yeah, yeah. We I... were just in Ireland last summer for his daughter's wedding. Oh, that's wonderful. You see, you see, Chris, you you see what's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> you blew you blew zach's mind right there uh, yeah yeah no it's sitting in a my puddle husband, over there somewhere on the ground so my husband was 15 15 years old i think they were roommates he must have been must have been older he was a teenager and he had a terrible stomach ache and Colum was massaging his stomach and giving him a guinness turns out that james had a burst appendix oh wow james says yeah when you were bursting my appendix you know, my good <laughs> burst my appendix. So they go way back. They're really close. Oh, that's that's incredible. Yeah. My mind's definitely been blown tonight for sure. I I can't even Chris ask something because I can't I can't uh, yeah. contain no, w- one Colum, of the Colum is one of my son's godfathers. Yeah. <laughs> or Jack's godfather. Oh. Yeah. Really good friends. And Rosalind is a good friend. Rosalind's husband Simon is William's godfather. So wow, really, really, really close friends. Everyone's well, connected. Yeah, no, jo- and and Rosalind is an amazing actress in her own right, and she was she was such a good pairing with Colm on DS Nine as as well on TNG and DS Nine as his wife. They were they were so good, and the way they played off each other was just fantastic. Both really, really, really top top notch actors. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, so, so let me ask you a question. Okay. Do you think that, um, do you think that Shelby is dead? Uh, I hope not. Me too. (laughs) I hope not. I mean, they, they, you know, you could watch the episode and go, oh, uh, wait, wait a second. What, what just happened? They brought her back and then now she's gone. But I mean, no one, it's hard for anybody to truly, truly die in Star Trek. You could die, quote unquote, and they can always find ways to bring people back. I don't know that she's dead, though. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they, I don't think she is. I think they they cut too fast. Yeah. Like, uh, the scene. Yeah, definitely. I, I don't think she's dead. I hope not. You and me both. Now, okay, Elizabeth, I got to ask you this question. Because we've been having a head-to-head debate here on the Random Richard podcast for quite a while now. And we've asked this question to some of other guests. We've asked it to the Shuttle Pod show. And we got to ask you. We uh, did. We have been doing this little mini-series called The Great Nerd Debate. Now, the first Great Nerd Debate was we argued Star Trek versus Star Wars, which is like the kind of the nerd civil war. and uh, And then we did a part two where we looked at the greatest, we narrowed it down to what we think is the greatest two decades for movies, not television shows, just movies of all time. Now, you can give us whatever answer you want. We narrowed it down to the 1980s versus the 1990s. If you think there's a different decade that you think is better, that's fine. But uh, if you had to vote for 
one or the other, do you think the 1980s or the 1990s is the greatest decade of all time for <laughs> movies? Oh, this is so hard because in the 90s, I didn't see any movies because I was having babies. <laughs> um, well, I will answer this. My favorite movie of all time is Roma. So whenever that came out, that's the best year. Roma, huh? Did you ever see it? I did not. I did not see it. It's so great. Um, the eighties here, you know, I the, I actually have not seen a lot of movies. I'm really, really bad, much to the chagrin of my filmmaker son. There's <laughs> movies I haven't seen because I go to the theater. I go to see three or four plays a week because when they're gone, they're gone. Movies there, I've never seen Casablanca. Wow, I've never, I've never seen The French Connection. I in the eighties, I was living in England. And going to the theater, I've never seen a John Hughes movie. Hmm. So I'm the worst person in the world to ask this. In the 90s, I was having kids. Give me an idea. What's the best movie from the 80s? Like emblematic, like the most 80s movie. I mean, for me personally, it's my favorite movie of all time. And that's Back to the Future. Okay. 1985. What about you? I, I love the Raiders of the Lost Ark, of course. Love watching those. For for me, I really enjoyed those. When yeah, did, the, when did Deer Hunter come out? I love that movie. I Deer think Hunter? that was. I think that was eighties. Seventies. I think I got to say that in terms of like film, films, you seventies. You've got Dog Day Afternoon, Deer Hunter, Chinatown. The mm. Deer Hunter it says was nineteen seventy eight. Oh, the seventies were were was an amazing Midnight Cowboy, Bonnie and Clyde. So many great, great classic movies. Yeah. Um, the 80s, I, I argue because the 80s had things like Ghostbusters, uh, Back to the Future. Uh, yeah, Raiders of the Lost Ark, like you said, Chris. Uh, I mean. Those it, are movies. Pop Gun. Talking about film. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> like Roma is a film. I mean, not to sound snobby, but I think my, my, I, I I, I don't deer hunter have you ever seen that yeah yeah Roger. it's been a been a long time but yeah oh my god what a movie yeah apocalypse now the godfather movies mm. that's all 70s yeah you know i think that film historians would actually say the 70s were, was that that was a great decade my favorite movie up until roma was dog day afternoon hmm. did you ever see that I haven't seen it either. No, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. I, it's actually been interesting. I've been on kind of a kick of watching a lot of classic movies. I've been going back and watching a variety of different things that I have just either never seen before or only seen, you know, bits and pieces. Uh, right now, I'm going back and watching through a variety of spaghetti westerns with uh, Clint Eastwood, mm -hmm. you know, the Dollars trilogy and Pale Rider and things like that that are just stuff that I, I know is out there, but I had just never seen. Did you ever see Silverado? With Kevin Costner? I did, yeah. yes, absolutely. That's really fun. That's a fun yeah. But yeah, you got to see Dog Day Afternoon. Oh my God, it's incredible. But see, I was 13 when it came out in the 70s. And I, um, I, I think that somebody your age now would watch it and go, it's so dated. It's so old fashioned, but it was so, so cool back then when I saw it. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the 70s did have, I mean, 70s had the first Star Wars movie, too. So, I mean, that was a, that's a, I mean, I know that's a movie, not Jaws. a film, maybe, but. Jaws. Oh <laughs> Jaws, that's right. Jaws. You know what's, what's funny? My kids just watched Jaws for the very first time last weekend. They'd never seen it, but they wanted to because we had gone to Universal Studios and they're like, we want to watch Jaws, damn. Okay. Here you go. And they watched the whole movie. They loved it. Nine years old. This is the nine year old. My nine year old and my seven year old. I have two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We because my my mom lived on the beach of Long Island, um, where we would go swimming in the ocean every day. Um, I tried to shield it from my sons because I was afraid of them getting afraid of the water because mm. we were literally right there on the beach, and they they weren't afraid. They were fine. Hmm. When we saw it, when it came out, I didn't go in the ocean for probably the next twenty years. Yeah. <laughs> 
Is- yeah, that had a big effect on people. My mom saw it when she was younger, and it freaked her out too. So that it freaked a lot of a whole generation of people out when that movie came out. Oceans and block- swimming pools. Out. First blockbuster, blockbuster, you know, it was um, it changed filmmaking forever. How filming was marketed, and you know, the summer release of a blockbuster changed everything. Yeah, great film. Um, I did want to ask you this. Um, g- going back to to uh, your role as Shelby, was there anything specific? looking back that you drew from to kind of help your approach and how you handled that character and somebody who was very confident, very sure of herself, just get in there, do the job. Don't care about anybody else. What sorts of things maybe from life experience or uh, watching other films and plays did you maybe use to draw on to help bring that character to life? Oh, wow. Um, uh, I remember There was a moment when I was walking on the Borg ship and we had the phasers out and I kind of almost felt like I was in a Western, Mm. like getting ready for a big shootout. And I remember thinking I need to be a total badass here and thinking like, walk like your dad. I'm Uh. like walking like my dad, like I'm, I mean business. And I'm not leaving here without being successful. Um, I remember that the the uh, the learning the lines was really really challenging. All the techno babble, and um, my very first day was the very first scene that I shot on Star Trek: uh, Best of Both Worlds. Was I think it's the ready room where I had to say uh, projection suggests that a Borg ship like this one could continue to function effectively, even if 78% of it were rendered inoperable. If you remember from the ready room, Mm -hmm. I was telling Jonathan and Will that I could not get that line out. I I don't know if it was nerves with everybody standing around the whole cast watching me, could not say it, could not say it cleanly. and I thought I was going to be fired. I went home and I was I was terrified. And when I watch the show now, I can see the terror in my eyes. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I really, I really thought I was going to be fired. And so I went home that night, and then lear- learned, uh, you know, the, what 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 we were going to have the next day, like tattooed on my brain, so that I could just like spit out that that dialogue. And I have worked on so many things that I couldn't tell you what the lines are, but I'll remember that line for, for my, to my last dying day. Hmm. So, yeah. so since we're talking about Shelby, if you, if you have your choice um, and let's say Shelby is alive, where would you like, uh, what, what would Shelby's kind of uh, future be? What, what would look like, what would that look like if you had your, any choice? That you have. Okay, so I'll throw out something, but I, because I don't watch and I didn't watch any of the series, I don't even know if this is a possibility, but could it be that Shelby is so dedicated to fighting the Borg that she active like you have all these people who are trying not to be assimilated, actively yeah. trying to be assimilated so she can understand them to get in behind their eyeballs. Oh. oh. What do you think about that? That's original. Yeah, no, that's great. If everybody's trying to not do it and yeah. not be assimilated and resisting them, what about I the only way we can beat them is I'm going to become them, but I'm going to figure out a way to come back or figure out a way to be, I don't know. Yeah. Well, if we look at what happens in the final episode of Picard season three, spoilers for those of you out there watching this, um, we've already reviewed it. So if you've been watching our, or listening to our podcast, you know what happens. Uh, but Picard kind of found a way. He went in after Jack and mm-hmm. pulled him out and came back out and didn't really get fully assimilated. So I think that with the way they um, wrote that final episode, there could easily be a way that they could do something like that for Shelby. So you've been fighting these guys for decades and right. they, that they have tried is not working. So why not infiltrate? 
why not somebody sacrifice themselves and go in and become one and try to figure out how to understand what drives them by becoming them. Yeah, very interesting. That would be kind of cool. So here's a, I, I, I kind of like to do these questions. It's kind of a what if question for you. I'll pose to you. So there was an episode of The Next Generation uh, called I Borg. And it involves, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it involves a, a character played by an actor named Jonathan DeLarco. And he plays a character named Hugh that is kind of separated from the collective. And then they have an opportunity to use Hugh as a um, a messenger sort of with this virus that he would take back to the collective and it would end them all. And it would be a way to kill off off the Borg and get a, get rid of them. Picard chooses not to do that because Hugh starts to become an individual. Have you seen that or know what I'm talking about when it comes to that character? Okay. So, okay. So thinking about that, mm -hmm. would commander Shelby do the opposite where she say, we've been fighting them. We have a chance to end the Borg. Would your character say, yeah, no, we're going to send him back as kind of a ticking time bomb. He's going to deliver this virus and he's going to wipe out the re our, our mortal enemies for such a long period of time. Possibly, but I'm thinking about like creative a show, like you have to have conflict. So if right. the Borg, if they, then if they actually solve that problem, what happens then? So do we then have another enemy, a new enemy? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think they're, they're, they have to decide if they're going to finish off the conflict with the Borg and move on to something else, or they keep, you know, changing it and keeping that conflict going. But I don't know how long you can, how long before you run out of ideas. Yeah. I mean, well, look, look at conflict in the world. Mm -hmm. Look at some of our tribal battles that have gone on for decades and decades and decades. They change with time, but they never kind of go away. Um, I think you could look at that. Yeah, that's true. Well, I look at the way they ended Picard, and they've kind of set it up for a legacy show or a new star trek series potentially featuring seven of nine as a captain of the new enterprise what is it chris is it the g now they renamed the titan the g enterprise yeah g. yeah i think it is the g yeah yeah they've set that up i mean i you know with captain seven in charge i i don't see any reason why they couldn't bring back admiral shelby right I maybe it's to, to be a to be a mentor for seven i mean here here's someone in, in this character that you played who was this kind of, you know, hot head, but, but she was on a pass. She knew what she needed to do. She knew what she wanted. She knew she got to get the job done. And she probably has changed quite a bit over the years, just like all the other characters in the series. And she could maybe be a mentor to someone like that. I mean, she's an admiral after all now, right? So. <laughs> sounds good to me. But it sounds like if that were to happen, I'd have to go back and watch all of the series to <laughs> do my homework. <laughs> figure out what's going on and how did we get here which i would happily do yeah i mean i i have, I have so many friends really really smart intelligent people who are just obsessed with this these 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 shows and you know i, I don't know why it just never really i don't know i've always been kind of like into more real life mm -hmm. than fantasy and it, it just hasn't grabbed me i don't know why like i've never seen lord of the rings never seen you know, I've seen, of course, Star Wars, the early ones when they came out in the 70s, but the new ones, I'm sorry. It's okay. You're Go ahead, Chris. Tell her how much she's missing with the new Star Wars. <laughs> with, with, Star, with Star Wars? Yeah, with the new Star Wars, the new Star oh. Wars trilogy. Tell her how much she's missing with that. Oh, I'm not a fan of the new Star Wars, so no. um, yeah, I don't think you're mi missing that. But people that. are loving this uh, Mandalorian, right? Everybody says that's really good. That is yes. The Mandalorian's been really good. Uh, Andor, Obi Wan were 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 okay. Um, but the original trilogy, even the prequels that were made in the late '90s, early 2000s, were pretty good. 
but the new the new series or the new trilogy yeah that's 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 uh it's it's no bueno chris <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. And, and I would say some of the episodes of Star Trek um, are are you know it's not it's not Shakespeare, but they try no. to have Shakespeare. And they they try they try to um, get lofty. inspiration from Shakespeare. Ideals, lofty, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, well, Elizabeth, we really want to thank you so much for being on with us on the Random Richard podcast. We thank you for taking the time out. I know you're incredibly busy. And we do appreciate that, getting a chance to talk with you, learn some more about you and your life and your career. Uh, give us an idea as to what types of things we can look forward to, besides what you already told us about. Any other projects or things we can look forward to going down the road? Oh, um, just all I have working on right now is Horizon. I mean, I've got, um, I do this thing. This is like so niche. Uh, every year, um, there's on June 16th, Irish people get together and they read uh, excerpts from James Joyce's Ulysses, and I direct the one at the mm -hmm. Hamlet Museum. So June 16th, um, the, all the Irish people gather to hear bits of uh, Ulysses read, and I can't be there because I'll be in Utah um, doing my uh, my little Western. I'm directing it still and then leaving them in good hands. That's awesome. So that and and, and Horizon and uh, hopefully um, not the end of Shelby. Yeah, hopefully not. Well, yeah, we had one of our our Picard reviews. Terry Metallis decided to drop in uh, in the live chat and say hello. So Terry, if you're watching this, bring back Shelby, please. <laughs> bring her back. We we want more. We want more now, Admiral Shelby. So that would be. Especially now that they've changed the um, onesies, the spandex onesies. Yes. <laughs> really cool tailored suits. Much, much more comfortable, much more flattering. Um, I'm all for it. I love, yeah. love the new costumes. I was going to say, I, I from from conventions I've gone to and interviews I've, I've watched and listened to, a lot of the cast weren't really a huge fan of the spandex stuff back then. Oh, it was hideous. You couldn't eat. You couldn't eat anything. If you ate a grape, it showed. Oh, goodness. Oh. And I'm sure they weren't. I mean, you know, uh, I, I remember in the early season stuff, there were interviews and in, in, uh, Patrick Stewart and Jonathan Frakes and stuff mentioned about how the the spandex was so immovable, like you couldn't really move or bend over and they got a lot of back pain from it and stuff. And um, yeah, I, I can only imagine uh, having to be in those things for the hours upon hours every day filming that stuff. Total wedgie city. <laughs> But you couldn't complain because the Borgs, the poor people playing the Borgs, they couldn't even pee. <laughs> so we weren't even allowed to complain about it. Yeah, I would imagine their makeup was and, and costuming and stuff was pretty intense and it was uncomfortable to say the least. Oh, unbelievable. I felt so sorry for them because also you can imagine like towards the end of the day, all that latex and all that rubber didn't smell very nice. No. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nasty. Yeah. So, well, again, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Best of luck or break a leg as you continue to uh, as you continue to film the rest of the uh, the movie series with Kevin Costner, and we look forward to watching that. And those of you out there watching and listening all over the globe, be sure to check that out. Uh, are those movies coming out in the theater? Or are they going to be on Paramount Plus? Do you know? What I was told is that they they want them to be in released on the big screen, but um, I am not sure if they're going to film. All all four before they release the first one. I'm not sure. So, okay. so, so they see what they have. Um, maybe they'll release movie one before the, they're all made. I don't, I can't remember anybody ever doing a serialized Western before. I mm. mean, series like Lonesome Dove, but not in um, a feature. I think it's really brave. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think, but I think it's going to be a hit. I mean, the cast that you guys have, it sounds like is going to be wonderful. We can't wait to see you in that. And uh, we look forward to to watching more of you uh, down the road, as well as hopefully a some more some more Shelby. We look, we definitely want that. That's for sure. So, well, Chris, this has been awesome. This thank has really so been much. fantastic. Such yeah. a treat. Absolutely. Great to see you. Great to see yep, you. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching and listening all over the globe. Be sure to check out us on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, we'll be back next time with more. And oh, by the way, for those of you watching, this is the season five premiere of the random Richard podcast. So Elizabeth, thank you for joining us here at the start of our season five of the random Richard podcast. 
My pleasure. All right. Take care, everybody. And we'll catch you next time right here on the Random Redshirt Podcast.